Good morning. Welcome to peace. Welcome to your Lord's house today. It's great to have you with us. It's great to, to be with our family today and gather around God's word. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, especially maybe those who are jo joining us online, my name is Jason Teal. Privileged to be able to be a pastor here and to lead us into God's word today. Today we're going to continue our uh, series that we started last week on a few of the Psalms of the Bible, kind of the songbook of the Bible. And this week we are going to take a look at Psalm 127, Psalm 127. And that, that psalm kind of gives us this theme that uh, the Lord builds the house, as you see on your service folder. And uh, what we're going to see is that uh, God, uh, he's the one who blesses all of our all of our work, and without him, everything's kind of meaningless. And so we, we entrust all of, our, all of our life, all of our workings to him and ask him to bless us. So also want to wish uh, happy Father's Day to all the fathers here today. Uh, may God bless us as we worship. Let's begin with our first song today. Our first song is printed on page two of the service folder, To God Be the Glory. I invite you to stand. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again in his great mercy. God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, you are my hope and stay. I will always sing your praise. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, where two or three gather in your name, you promise to be with them and share their fellowship. Look on us, your family, and graciously bless us with unity and harmony. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we'll have a message just for the children. And uh, I'm just curious. It's up to you guys. But I'm wondering if, if children are comfortable yet to come forward. As you're welcome to. Or if you're not yet, you can stay in your pew too. Depends who's first, right? Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Yeah, you can want to go right here, or right here, whichever. Thank you for coming up. <laughs> All right, that's okay. So, kids, if I can have your attention, I'll, I'll just wherever you are, I'll, I'll kind of give a message from Jesus, right? So this week, I got a, a letter in the mail, a card in the mail. Have you ever got? Letters in the mail. When the mail comes, is it ever for you? You ever get those? Sometimes, right? Usually you get cards for a very special occasion, maybe a special day coming up. And sure enough, I open the card, and you know what it says? Happy Father's Day. Did you know that today is Father's Day? Yeah, today is a day that we get to celebrate dads and, and say thank you to God for, for our dads. I wonder if you can answer me a couple questions. What, what are some things that you are thankful for about your dad? What, why are you happy about your dad? Does, does anybody brave enough to answer? What are some things that we say thank you for dad for? Let me start out. Do, do your dads love you? Do they play with you? Do they make you laugh? Yeah. They maybe, just like mommies do too, they, they go to work and, and they are able to give you a nice bed and a, and a house, right? There's all kinds of things that we say thank you to dad for because dads love us and they make sure that we're, we're happy, right? Did you know that every day you come to church is kind of like Father's Day? There's a part in our church service, maybe you remember this, where we have a prayer and we talk to our father, but not our dad who's sitting next to us, but we say, our father in heaven. Do you remember that prayer? Right after the sermon, we're going to say that prayer, our father in heaven. Do you know who we're talking about? We're talking about God. And we're saying thank you to our, our God because he is our father in heaven. He's the one who loves us so much. Remember how much he loved us? He died for our sins. He says, I love you and I forgive you. Our Father gives us all good things. We're going to be talking about that today in our longer message, that God provides all things for us, and, and God makes sure that we get to be with him forever in heaven. So today on Father's Day, I want you to be thankful and happy for your dads, but I also want you to say thank you to our God because he is our Father in heaven. Amen. Thanks for coming up. Let's focus our attention on some lessons from God's Word. Uh, both of our lessons today are going to kind of supplement the, the theme of the psalm that we're taking a look at in our sermon. So our first lesson in Joshua kind of encapsulates the whole psalm where it talks about as, as Israel was going to go into the promised land, the land that God promised to give them, um, there were going to be temptations all over the place. And one of the temptations for them was going to be to be in the land and start working and having all these nice things and think, that was me. I did all of this. And uh, pretty soon, they 
themselves, their, their abilities, the things they have, they, they became their gods. And so Joshua, their leader, as they went into that land, gave them a good reminder that all of this is from the Lord. And even as you enjoy these great blessings, remember to serve the Lord in everything. It's the Lord who blesses everything. And may that always be our attitude as well. A lesson from Joshua 24. Joshua said, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly and faithfully. Remove the gods that your fathers served in the region across the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if you see no benefit in serving the Lord, then choose for yourselves today whomever you will serve, whether the gods that your fathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Ammonites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. This is the word of our God. The gospel records the, the words, the works of our Savior Jesus, and so well, we stand in respect. So I invite you to stand. Now, the second half of Psalm 127 really speaks to one, a very specific blessing that the Lord gives, and that's the blessing of children. And so it talks about families. And so Jesus' words here are very interesting. He talks about all of us being in his family, that we are brothers and sisters of the Lord, that we are all children of God. It's an awesome comfort to know that we are in Jesus' family. Why? Not because of any kind of human blood relationship, but because of the blood relationship, the blood that he shed for us. We are God's children. And so as we do his will of believing in him, we are his family. The gospel according to Mark chapter 3. Then Jesus' mother and his brothers arrived. While they were standing outside, they sent word to Jesus calling for him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they began to tell him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. He replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And he looked at those who sat around him in a circle, and he said, Look, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. <laughs> our next song, I, I made a mistake in the bulletin, I apologize. It's actually Psalm 127, the psalm that we're going to sing. Um, and these, these are actually the words of Psalm 127 uh, put into a way that we could fit into a hymn verse. And so we're going to sing the text of our uh, sermon that we're going to base today. Grace, mercy, and peace. What wonderful blessings are yours from God our Father. They come to us through our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I think sometimes we say some things that are just completely obvious. Right? We state the obvious. We, th we say things that are so obvious that we probably don't even need to mention them. But sometimes we do that in order 
to make a point, to emphasize something. And I'll just give you an example of what I'm talking about. It's something, a phrase like this. You get what you pay for. Well, we say that a lot, but have you ever thought about that statement? It's like, duh, of course. You paid for something and then you get it. You get what you pay for. But you also understand the point. You, you say it, an obvious thing, so that you can emphasize a point to someone. Now, the reason I mention that is because that's called a truism. A, a truism. Uh, truism is a statement that is used in, as a rhetorical advice. Uh, obviously true, but it's stated to emphasize a point. We have a lot of truisms in our culture, but this week as I studied Psalm 127, I realized that we have a lot of truisms in our culture that have to do with emphasizing hard work and the rewards that come with them. I've just made a little list here of the ones that I came across. <laughs> there we go. You reap what you sow. That's a pretty obvious thing. Uh, another one could be framed like in a, in a break room of your company office. Success isn't an accident. Hard work pays off. Now, the one that's used in sports realm a lot, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. The early bird gets the worm. Sometimes we even add a little biblical element to them, even if they're not found in the Bible, like this one. God helps those who help themselves. I've heard that one a lot of times, too. Just curious if anybody else has some truisms coming to mind as I mention those. There you go. Absolutely. You work, you eat. That one might be an adaption of Proverbs, right? You work, you eat. Good. We hear these things a lot. We, we sometimes repeat them and say them, and so we kind of accept them to be true, and we think, well, these have to be truisms, right? But when you make a big, long list of them, and as you think about more and more, here's the problem. Is anybody else, as, as the list goes on, does anybody else have their stress level go a little higher? <laughs> yeah, I do too. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm all about having a good work ethic. But I think if we, if we really start to believe these things and only these things, that, that hard work is the only key to being rewarded in life, that, that any good thing that we have is solely a result of my hard work, it all depends on me, what's the only reward you're really left with? I think during that time of thinking that, you have a lot of stress and you have a lot of worry. And I think at the end, because you don't get to keep it all, there's no U-Hauls on a hearse, right? Uh, you, don't, you ultimately ended up with disappointment and discontentment. Right? I have a hunch that on Father's Day, a lot of you guys know what I'm talking about, right? And I don't mean to stereotype. I know, ladies, you have these kind of worries too, but I, mean, I guess I'm, th I'm thinking personally here. Guys don't like to admit that they worry, but deep down, if we worry, if we're honest, these are the kinds of things we work, worry about. Have I done enough? Am I working hard enough? Am I providing enough? And then even if we get to a point in life where we think, okay, I've kind of done it, then it's like, do I have to keep up this pace to just maintain it? It's stress, it's worry, and we stay up at night, we get up early, just like the psalm is talking about here. I'm just wondering today, is it possible that these truisms about hard work maybe aren't so true? Have we been fibbed to just a little bit? As we say that, the rugged, individual, industrious American spirit is like, they, I don't like those questions, right? But here's the thing. Those are the questions that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is asking today as we take a look at Psalm 127. Today, as we, as we dig into this psalm, what I'd like to explore is this. I want to explore the relationship between human work and God's blessing. It's so easy to get it all mixed up. So God bless us as we take a look at this psalm. We sang the words before. I'm just going to read them now. You can follow along on the screen or there's, uh, it's written in your bulletin. There's also opportunities for notes in there. I'm going to focus today on especially the first two verses. If the Lord does not build a house... It is useless for the builders to work hard over it. If the Lord does not watch over the city, it is useless for the watchman to stand guard. It is useless for you to get up early and to work late, worrying about bread to eat, because 
God grants sleep to the ones he loves. Let's take a look at these words of God. My next question is a little strange, but there's a point to it. I'm curious if you have a certain playlist in your car for On the Way to Church. Do you have On the, Church, on the Way to Church playlist? You do? Okay. I have a friend who, in his truck, he's got XM radio, and he said that every single day, all day long, at the really loud volume, there's one station going, and it's XM Hair Nation. So 80s rock bands. And so I always thought about that when he walked into church. Like, how's that transition from Motley Crue and Def Leppard to, like, to God be the glory from Christian worship? Like, how does that work? But that's what it is. So I'm just curious if you listen to the radio on the way to church or is it no radio? I think we always, when we had to drive to church, was like a no radio thing. Why do I ask that? I know that ancient Israel did not have... Spotify, they didn't have FM, they didn't have XM, but they had a playlist for On the Way to Church. You see, in the book of Psalms, if you would open that book and you look under certain headings of the Psalms, you will see this phrase, Songs of Ascent. There's 15 of them in the book of Psalms. Psalm 127 is one of them, and these were written for the very purpose of going to church. So Jerusalem was up on a hill, and up on the highest point of the hill was the temple. And so as big groups of people gathered from outside of Jerusalem and traveled to Jerusalem to, to worship at these great festivals, these are the songs they would sing. They would sing them as they ascend the hill to the temple. So this was like, these were like their playlist on the way to church. Now, you heard the words of Psalm 127. You sang them. Did they sound like a pump you up for church kind of song? I'll be honest, it, it didn't to me. And not just the music, the music was great, uh, but like the words, talking about building and watching and waking up early, maybe that's for church, uh, staying up late. How does that have to do with church? I think you have to put it all into context of Israel, their relationship to Jerusalem and the temple. So just a quick bit of Israelite history the Israelites had a lot of living on a promise, a lot of waiting, a lot of um, wandering. That was 400 years of like, slavery in Egypt, but then it took 480 years after they left Egypt when finally their biggest building project in their history took place. Finally, God got his permanent home in Jerusalem at the temple. So just imagine after all that, the people's excitement, this building project. There is the house of the Lord. And read about it in 2 Kings chapter 6 sometimes. It's an amazing building project. The materials that were used were exquisite. The, the craftsmanship was amazing. And so people had this pride. As they went to the temple, they thought about these things, about the building and the watching and the late nights, the early mornings, all that went into this. And they sang about it. Then, of course, in their history, the temple was destroyed. Um, they were carried off to another nation called Babylon, and for 70 years they were there. But after 70 years, they came back, and what did they do? They rebuilt the temple. That was important to them. And again, all of the work that went into it, read about it in the book of Nehemiah. And here's where it's a neat connection to Psalm 127, the building and the watching. Nehemiah describes this building project as uh, they were building this the walls and, and then building the temple. And of course, the nations around them didn't want them to rebuild. And so they kept attacking them while they're trying to rebuild. And so they were up all night. They were up early in the morning working and they were watching always over their shoulder. And Nehemiah describes it as they were holding a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. They were building and they were watching. So imagine being an Israelite. You're making this pilgrimage to go worship at church. You see the temple in the distance and these are the kinds of thing, things you're thinking of. In fact, we, we know they were because there's an example in the New Testament, Luke 21, where the disciples were going up to Jerusalem with Jesus for a festival, and it says they were talking about the temple, how it was decorated with beautiful stones and offerings. I wonder if Jesus and his disciples were singing Psalm 127, thinking about the building, thinking about the watching, thinking about the hard work and the dedication and marveling at all these things. So that's the context. 
It's all leading to this. This is what I want you to think about. In their happiness over the building in the distance that was God's house, the beauty of it, in their marveling at the hard work and the accomplishments of their ancestors, in their own pride over continuing to carry on that hard work ethic, do you think there might have been a temptation for them? I think there was, and I'll give a personal example. Uh, Years ago when Natalie and I bought our house, uh, there was a a room in the basement that was still unfinished. And so as soon as we moved in, uh, that was my project. For the first couple of months, I was down there all the time doing all the work, the framing, the insulating, the sheetrocking, the painting, the ceiling, everything. First time I ever did anything like that. And so finally it was done, and yet... Weeks after it was done, I found myself still going down there. Why? Was it because there's more work to do? No, it's because I was admiring my work. Like, wow, look at this. I did this. I'm, I'm pretty good. <laughs> like, this is amazing, right? Now, was it hard work? Was it long hours? Yeah. Was I proud of my accomplishment? Absolutely. But after a while, I realized I should have built the room a little bigger to be able to fit my head in it and to fit all my pride that I was carrying around, right? That, that's the temptation I'm talking about when it comes to hard work. And I'm wondering if you ever fall into that kind of temptation. You walk out in your garage or your shed, wow, this is my stuff. You drive up to your house and go, wow, look at what I've provided for myself. This is nice. You think about your bank account and say, you know what? Man, I've worked hard for this. This is, this is me. Think, look at my relationships. Look at my reputation. Look at my job accomplishments. Look at me. All of this stuff, it's about me. It depends on me. I think that is the temptation to think, I've worked hard, so all of this depends on me. Now, I know... It's hard work, and I know you are wise, and you are skilled, and and you have worked hard for the things that you have, but I wonder if when Israel was looking at all these things, when I look at my things, when you look at your things, are we forgetting anything? Are we forgetting anyone? That's the point of this psalm. That's why they sang this on the way. So they wouldn't just look at what they did, but look at what God did. I want you to take a look at... uh, Some of these, there's a phrase in here I want you to take a look at. It's this right here, in vain. Why don't you just say that phrase with me, please? In vain. It's interesting that that phrase is used after the the things that we take pride in. We build in vain. We watch in vain. We rise early and we stay up late. We work hard in vain. What does in vain mean? It means useless. That's the other translation we heard this morning, right? It's a waste. Why? It's a waste when it's all about us. Think about Israel. They built this kingdom and it was a great kingdom, but as soon as they left God out, that's when it all came crumbling down. And as we build our own little kingdoms, and we do it all on oursel- by ourselves and think this is all about us, God says that is in vain. So what's the reminder of the psalm? There's another phrase I want you to take a look at. Unless the Lord. Why don't you say that phrase with me? Unless the Lord. The Lord is everything. Without the Lord, it's useless, it's a waste. But with the Lord, it's everything. And then everything becomes for the Lord. With the Lord, it's everything, and everything is for the Lord. That's what this psalm is a reminder of. And I think here's what this all means. There's a relationship, yes, with our hard work, but also with God's blessing. We foolishly think that our hard work is the only thing that brings good things into our lives. Or we're foolish to think that all the good things we have, that solely depends on me. The truth is, 
No human effort can prosper without God's blessing. Talk about a truism. That is the truth. And it's a practical truth. That's what these psalms we're looking at are, are really telling us. There, there's some practical wisdom here. It has two sides. Yes, work hard. Give your best effort to everything you do, no matter what you do, because those, your skills, your wisdom, that, that's God's gift to you. But don't think it all depends on you, because actually it all depends on God. Do your best and then rest. Relax. Trust God. Be content with what he has provided for you. Now, I learned uh, a long time ago that one of the worst things to say to people who stress over things is relax, right? Very bad thing to say. Like, you want that for them, but you don't say that to them. Don't command it, because it doesn't happen. So how can I say to you, as you have all these things on your mind like I do, relax? I say that because of who God is and because of what he is capable of. That's the whole point. It's, it's making a point from a greater truth to a lesser truth. In other words, if, if something's true about this really big thing, then the littler things are absolutely true. So the last thing I want you to think about today is this. What is your greatest worry? Beyond daily needs, beyond stuff, beyond your job, beyond your relationships even, Isn't it what happens when all those things are gone? Isn't it your eternity? Isn't it where you stand with your God? And if it isn't, maybe I would encourage you to maybe think about that a little bit. Because you can work as hard as you can your whole life. You can build, you can watch over it, but it's all going to be gone. And there you are before your God. And no matter how hard you've worked, even in a spiritual sense, you, you and I, we just can't live up to his standard of complete perfection, ever. And, and to be honest, what the Bible tells us, that's the one and only requirement for a relationship with him now and forever, complete perfection. You talk about stress. But that's why you look at who God is and what he is capable of. You see, God is a God of hard work, too. God works way harder than we do. You see, what we fail to accomplish, God set out to work to accomplish for us. This is an amazing fact. A relationship with you is what means the most in all the universe to God. Isn't that amazing? A relationship with you is what means the most to him. And so... He gave up everything. He gave up the only relationship he had, the one to his son, so that he could send him out of heaven to this corrupt earth so he could do all the work to accomplish what we cannot. So Jesus had to be perfect, and he was. The Bible describes him as the holy one, the righteous one. He was without sin, and as we have faith in him, he comes and he wraps that holiness around us. And so when every time God looks at you, that's what he sees, Jesus' holiness. And as our substitute, Jesus had to take on all of our shame and all of our punishment that we deserve for our sins. And he did, the cross. He died on the cross and every one of your sins is paid for. It's gone. And the other thing Jesus had to do as our substitute was overcome the one thing that overcomes all of us. No matter how hard we work, nobody has ever overcome death, but Jesus did. He rose from the dead, so you do have life now and forever. That is the work of our God. Can you even fathom that? Just, just try to think about that. For, for people who are so puffed up with pride over their own puny accomplishments, for people who have forgotten about God or left him behind or snubbed him for people who cannot live up to what he is. Yes, for you and for me, God worked. God worked your forgiveness. God worked 
your acceptance into his family. God, work your salvation and your eternal life. Wow. That's the big thing, right? So what does that say about the rest of the things in your life? Those things that you and I worry about so often, those are the lesser things. What does it say about all those things? There's a beautiful passage that is one of my favorite that helps us to to trust and to rest in God. It says, He who did not spare his own son, but he gave him up for us all. Well, now, how will he not also along with Jesus graciously give us all things? (sighs) That is stress relieving. That is relaxing. That is restful. And I think that's why uh, the first half of the psalm ends in this way. God grants sleep to the ones he loves. There's a disconnect here. I'm sorry. But yeah, the, the last verse says, God grants sleep to those he loves. Leave it in God's hands. Rest easy in him. Do you see why this song makes sense as a on the way to church playlist type of thing? Especially for the Israelites as they were looking at all the the beauty of the Jerusalem and the temple, it it just puts everything into perspective, right? All the things that we have on our mind from the whole week and now we come to God's house, it puts it all into perspective. Yes, the building that we have, people built that, but the Lord builds not the building, but his house, the people, his church. Right? And, and I know that, like, especially for Israel, that rich history of the capital city, we have a rich history as a congregation. We watched over that, but the Lord watches over his people. And then being in the house itself, being in the temple for Israel, being in church for us, it's all about God's work, isn't it? His grace, his mercy, his blessings to us. So I'm not going to tell you what to listen to on the way to church. If, you know, Zach Brown or Bon Jovi is piping out of your radio, you do you. That's fine. But I will say to take this psalm with you. Let it be an encouragement to you. Let it put everything into perspective for you. Because, yes, work is a fact of life. And work hard. But here's the truth. Work is not life. God is your life. God is the one who brings meaning and fulfillment to your work here on this earth. And then when you talk about the greater thing, God is what it's all about in the work of salvation. He did it all for you so you have peace. Rest and relax and find enjoyment in him. So a quick note. Uh, We've only gone through the first two verses of, of Psalm 127, right? And you're thinking, okay, it's been a little bit, and we have two more verses left. That's what I was thinking, too. So I have a bunch of notes on verses 3 and 4, too. But I'm going to do something different this week. Rather than make you sit a little more through a sermon, I'm going to continue the discussion of Psalm 127 in our Bible class on Wednesday night. Okay, so that has to do with a very specific blessing of uh, children and family. And so how does all this fit with what we just talked about with hard work? Uh, I'm going to use a marketing technique, I guess. Tune in for the second half this week on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, at our Bible class, okay? So let me just finish this se- section of the psalm with... Uh, A quick illustration, okay? One last illustration. I talked about the truisms of hard work, and I noticed that kind of carries through on Father's Day. You look at the Father's Day section of cards in the store, and a lot of them have to do with hard work, right? You see on the the front of a lot of these cards, if it's not fishing, there's a lot of tools on them. You see saws and hammers and tape measures and duct tape. Okay, duct tape isn't a tool, but it is on a lot of Father's Day cards for some reason. I think that's because Dad's We like to be known for hard work, right, historically. And I get that. I mean, my dad is hands down the hardest worker I know. One of my first memories, some of my earliest memories of my dad is working up in the Henderson Mine just north of Idaho Springs, changing these huge, bigger-than-people mining equipment tires. So that was an early memory. And even now today, my dad's going out on a service call to fix combine and tractor tires. He's... You look at my dad's forearms and his stained hands, that's what I think of when I think of hard work. So I get it when cards really put these truisms out about dads and hard work. But the reason I bring it up is because when I write out my card, my Father's Day card to my dad, as great as that is and as much as I admire it, that's not what I'm most thankful for 
for my dad. What I'm thankful for is something more important that he has shared with me. That all that hard work that we do and all the things it provides, it's nothing, it's in vain compared to knowing God's work and his salvation for us. That all that we have, that's a gift from him. Our time, our stuff. That, that church is not something mom makes us go to. It's something we get to come and hear. It's an opportunity to come and hear what God has done for us. That, that the relationships we have in our life, those are about sharing Jesus and God's love with others. And I think that's why, even though my dad works hard, he's not a worrier. He rests in the Lord's work. And so that's my prayer for each and every one of us. I know there are a lot of truisms about hard work. I know we take pride in that as Americans, and that's a good thing, but there's nothing truer than this. It's a Bible passage. It's all about God's work in all things. In all things, God works for the good of his loved ones. Rest peacefully and joyfully in God's work. Amen. Now may that peace that God gives that goes beyond any of our understanding, may that guard to keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time, just a, a reminder as we give thanks to God for all that he has worked for us, uh, an opportunity to give thanks to God is with our offerings. So if you have brought an offering physically today, there are plates in the back by the, by the windows, and you're welcome to give an offering there. There's also an online opportunity, so there's a QR code if you want to scan that or a link uh, on our webpage. Uh, what a beautiful opportunity to say thank you to God, to gather as a congregation to do that and to, to make sure that we're continuing to spread God's love to each other and to our community. I invite you now to stand and let's declare our faith together. Page 6. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. What a privilege to be able to bring what is on our hearts to our God in prayer. Uh, this morning we want to have a, a special prayer for Andrew Fink as he uh, has uh, received and accepted a call uh, to teach at uh, Wisconsin Lutheran High School. So he'll be a part-time instructor and a dorm supervisor, is that correct? So we want to uh, both wish him God's blessings and, uh, and, uh, and say thank you for the blessing that he has been to our congregation uh, during this time here. So we go to God in prayer. Gracious God, uh, we come to you today giving you thanks for this opportunity to gather in peace and, uh, and enjoy to be able to hear your word. Uh, we don't take this privilege and opportunity lightly. But as we come to you, we do come confessing that uh, throughout the week, so much of our, of our mindset can be confused because we have to work hard in this life and we thank you for the ability to work hard, but it's easy to fall into that temptation of thinking that 
everything in our life, everything in this world depends on us, and we leave you out of it so often. So we confess that to you, Lord, and we, we thank you for working hard on our behalf to give us that, that wonderful forgiveness and that wonderful peace to know that not only are we forgiven, not only are we part of your family, but, but you are the one who graciously gives all things and blesses our labor. Help us to be mindful of that and, and to be able to share that joy with so many others. Today we want to give you thanks also for the wonderful blessing of fathers in our life. We thank you for their hard work. We thank you for their love. We thank you for their joy. Um, and we ask that you continue to bless fathers everywhere, that they not only uh, raise children in a way that, that brings up good American citizens, but, but even more importantly, to bring up children for you, that they can know that the greatest joy, the, the greatest blessing they have comes from you and your forgiveness that you give us. Lord, we want to also thank you for uh, allowing us this time with Andrew at our congregation here at Peace. Thank you for uh, his encouragement as he attends worship regularly, and thank you for his musical gifts that he has shared with us on a regular basis as well. And we ask you to go with him to Wisconsin Lutheran High School and, and bless his ministry there as he uh, teaches uh, kids at the high school, students at the high school. Uh, may his ministry be a joy, and may it be a blessing for all those around him. We pray all these things in our Savior's name, and we continue the prayer he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. So we continue with Holy Communion. Uh, as you have opportunity, if you'd like, on pages 9 and 10, there are some uh, questions and things written to help you prepare your heart for the Lord's Supper and to understand how we practice communion here at peace. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who called us to be his own so that we might live under him in his kingdom. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated. So we will distribute communion like we've done the last uh, few weeks. Um, the only difference would be, uh, I think now with the, the pew set up this way, why don't we have, we'll start on, on the baptismal font side and come up the, the middle and receive the, the bread and the wine and then go back on the side. And there's a wastebasket in the back to, to throw your cups away. And then once that side is done, we'll have uh, the, the ambo side, the lectern side, come up the middle and do the same and then exit, exit that way. We'll see how that works. So uh, any feedback is, is good. Um, I'm going to sanitize my hands and we can prepare our hearts for receiving the Lord's Supper.
I invite you to stand for prayer. Let's pray together the prayer on the top of page 8. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this holy supper. Through this gift you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn, Love is the Gracious Gift. So this hymn was chosen when I was still going to include the second half of the psalm in our, in our sermon today, but it talks about that gift of, of love uh, from God to us, and especially uh, love among Christians and love in the family.
Good morning again. Good morning to those joining us online. Uh, just a privilege to be in God's house and to have him build his house, his people, uh, and to enjoy those blessings of his word. A couple of announcements today. Uh, announcement uh, that July 10th, there's a, like a softball tournament among churches on the front range. And so if anyone's interested in being part of our, our team, we have like five. We need five more. So uh, it's, it's just for fun. Uh, we're going to try not to pull any hammies or anything. Uh, so if, if you're interested even a little bit, just, just let me know. Or you can, con- you can contact me or uh, Michael Schlittenhart, uh, as who's helping me put this together too. So um, we need guys and girls, so it's co-ed. And then another announcement would be just a, a reminder that um, as, we start ga- as we gather again, uh, all these blessings come with uh, things to do as well. So if, you're, if you have the time and the, and the willingness, there are some opportunities for you to serve your Savior. Um, things from like setting up communion or even you know, cleaning and, and just getting God's house ready for, for guests. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. You can do that. Or if a if, uh, sign-up sheet isn't your style, just, just contact me. I'll let you know uh, things that need to be done. We're happy to uh, have everybody involved. This is all of, our, all of our church, so thanks for that, including, as I was looking at the bulletin as we were going through the service today, maybe even a, a position of uh, proofreader, so that'd be good. <laughs> Sorry about that. It was one of those weeks. Um, other than that, any other blessing or any other blessings? Yeah, any other announcements to, that anybody are on people's minds? Okay, thanks for being here, and God go with you throughout this week. Have a great week in your Lord. Draws to thee, for then shall we walk in thy steps for. Listen no. Inherit and ever dwell where sin.